Buddy, this is CJ Wiley with more adventures on the road. This is my YouTube live, so uh, it's an experiment. But I wanted to use the fact that so many people have requested stories about Earl Strickland. And I know Earl Strickland really well. We've played a lot of golf together. We've played tennis together. We've played some really big uh, matches as a matter of fact, the first time I was on ESPN was at the Burbank Hilton and uh, just north of uh, Los Angeles. And I just beat Francisco Bustamante 13 12, and I played uh, Earl on ESPN. And I have to say, I was nervous, but uh, when I went back and watched it, which I, it took a few years before I watched it because I, I really didn't want to see how well I actually played. And when I did watch it, I was pretty impressed because, you know, I could feel the nervousness, but it didn't show. And I was happy about that. That's like uh, when Earl was my partner at the Moscone Cup, rack with him as my partner to win the Moscone Cup back in 96. And that was the most pressure I've ever felt in a game of pool. <laughs> and my hands were shaking so bad that I had to press my bridge hand tightly on the, uh, the bed of the table to keep my hands from shaking. But when I watched it, you really couldn't tell. And I was happy about that. And, you know, no matter how much you play this game in front of lots of people and under lots of pressure, you're always going to feel that nervousness. And, uh, you know, I always take, for example, when Earl made that shot for a million dollars in my pool room. It was a combination shot. And uh, he said later that his hands were shaking and, and I couldn't see it. And he made that shot. I've always laughed about the fact that uh, I don't think too many people could even hit the ball, <laughs> you know? So uh, anyway, yeah, I've got a lot of Earl Strickland stories and I'll, I'll share some of them. I mean, one of the ones that, uh, you know, is kind of some inside information and, and uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm cool to, uh, to tell the story. Earl told it to me himself. Is when we went to Hong Kong. And, uh, well, we played in a team event. But, but what he's known for is playing Efren Reyes in Hong Kong with the same promoter, Robert Moore, where they played a race to uh, like 120, I think. And uh, he was ahead 20 games. And Efren came back and, and beat him. Well, Earl was, was you know, pretty uh, vocal about that he thought the promoter had, uh, had paid this girl to come in, a very attractive girl who had a short skirt on. And uh, I don't think she had any uh, panties on because she was like at an angle with Earl that he said was uh, uh, sharking him. <laughs> Plus, there were some people in the audience that were giving him trouble, and, and he swore that the promoter had that staged. So anyway, people just thought, oh, that's just Earl. He's crazy, and he's making excuses, and uh, blah, blah, blah. But what I know is Earl told that promoter, he said, I'm never coming back here. I'm never playing for you again, and I know what you did. And the guy denied it. But three days after Earl got back home, uh, Robert Moore got a hold of, of him, and uh, or maybe it was his wife, Lisa at the time, and said, you're right, Earl, I did that, and uh, to make it right, I'm going to wire you the, uh, the difference between the prize money, which was $80,000. Uh, Efren won $100,000 if my memory serves me right, and Earl got 20 for finishing second. So he wired him $80,000 to make it right. And I respect him a lot for that. You know, Robert Moore, he's no longer with us, but he was uh, a really big gambler, one of the biggest in the world at the uh, Hong Kong racetrack, and they were betting on horses. And one of the things they were doing, since the Chinese people are superstitious, they were putting propaganda pieces in the newspaper and using the names of key horses in certain races as the headline 
of these articles. Like if Magic Dragon was running in the fifth race, they would put something about, you know, dragons being magic and, uh, you know, you can, you know, read it in these five books or whatever the case may be. I'm making this up. But it would trigger them to see that thinking it's some kind of a sign and they would load up on um, on those horses. Well, that would change the odds. And Robert Moore and, and his group would bet, of course, the other way. And uh, they were making uh, a lot of money doing that. And, uh, you know, it's a tragic end. You know, they found him with, uh, from my understanding, with his head in a gas oven with it turned on. So, uh, you know, he was messing with some people there that, that he shouldn't know. But he was a great guy. I mean, I really liked him. When he had a few drinks, he was a little different. But uh, when we went over to play the team event, you know, I was with Earl for that. And man, he gave us the first class treatment. I got on my airplane and, uh, you know how they usually tell you to go to the back where you're, you know, sitting and you show them the ticket number or whatever the, uh, the flight attendant pointed at the, sp the spiral staircase and told me that's where your seat is. So I went up this staircase in the airplane and it was, uh, you know, it was first class. I mean, really first class because the seats that we uh, were given folded into a bed. We got filet mignon and an incredible meal. And when I got to the hotel, when I went up to my hotel, I was up on like the 52nd floor. I mean, the view was incredible in downtown Hong Kong. And I had a, a, a like a, not a 360, but a, but a, about a 180 degree view where the curtains would open up about half the room. And uh, I had a remote control on my bed. Now, this is in 1996. So this was like high tech. I had a remote control that would, I could hit a button and it would open up all the curtains. I could push a button and make coffee. Uh, you know, of course, the TV and the air conditioner and everything was on this, uh, this remote control. So it was incredible. And uh, one of the nights they took us to dinner, we went over to, I don't know, in a limo. They drove us. It took about 40 minutes to get there. It was on the other side of the island. And uh, when we were going up this hill to the restaurant, the limo driver pulled over to a warehouse. And we all got out. We didn't really know what was going on. So we go in this warehouse, and, and it's huge. And it's like stacked you know, about halfway up to the ceiling with aquariums. Well, we went around and, and figured out pretty quick, we were going to pick out the food that we were going to eat. You want to talk about fresh. And Robert Moore recommended this one type of fish he said was the most expensive in the world. And uh, of course, we got some of that. <laughs> and, uh, and we, you know, picked out a variety of things. They put it all in a plastic bag. Then we went to the limo. And uh, the limo driver opened up the, uh, the trunk and put the uh, plastic bag in the trunk. We drove, you know, the rest of the way up to the top of the hill to the restaurant. We all got out. The driver got out, got the plastic bag, went up, you know, to the left of the entrance. And somebody came out, grabbed the plastic bag and took it back in one of the back doors. So then we sat down and, and proceeded to uh, get served all this fresh seafood. So Earl and I have been through uh, some some pretty amazing uh, adventures together. And, uh, you know, and that's not even really the, the, the stories about us playing. Uh, of course, it's, it's well known that, that he ran 11 racks in a row at my pool room to win the million dollar challenge. He did it the first day. The odds were six point or 7.8 million to one is what a statistician, a uh, professor of uh, economics, I think, from SMU put that together for the uh, insurance company. And as everyone knows, there's, uh, there was a problem with the insurance, and, and I made a documentary about it that's at my website uh, and my private group, cjwiley.com. You can see that documentary. So I don't want to get into all the details, but but Earl and I did play in the finals. He beat me in the semifinals. I played uh, Paul Potsier, to who 
you know, to see who got a chance to play Earl again. And he had me 10 to four. And I came back and won seven games in a row to beat Paul Potsier and play Earl again in the finals, which I was uh, fortunate to, to prevail that time. And, uh, you know, that was quite a feat considering that Earl was playing some of the best pool that, that he's ever played or anybody's ever played to run 11 racks in a row in a professional event that will never be duplicated, especially now they're playing like alternate breaks. And I just don't agree with that because of the excitement factor. It's always really cool to see people, you know, the players run multiple racks. I mean, the most, Racks I ever ran in a major tournament was the U.S. Open, and it was against Earl Strickland. I ran the first seven racks in a row, ended up playing safe, locking him between two balls, and then uh, he missed the kick, and I ran uh, that one and two more. It was 10 to nothing, and, and the only shot he had was that kick shot. But when that happened, I could feel the momentum change, and um, I thought he was going to come back and beat me. So it was 11-1, or it was 10-1, it was 10-2, it was 10-3. And I remember sitting in my chair, and I'm thinking to myself, self, <laughs> you're going to have to win this match. If you play not to lose, he's going to come back and beat you. So I remember having a bank shot that I, I could have played safe on, but I went ahead and shot the shot, banked it in the side, went around three rails for position, ended up winning the match 11-4. Uh, to four. But that's how good Earl Strickland is. Uh, you know, he can do certainly to me what I can do to him. And I've seen him come back from a 10 to nothing uh, deficit. Uh, I can't remember who he was playing, but, but you know, that does happen. And uh, I think Nick Varner's done that before. And, you know, it's been done a few times. I've never been down 10 to nothing and come back and, and won in a tournament, though. I can say that. That takes, you know, a lot. You got to have some luck and you got to have some uh, incredible uh, firepower. But I will probably guarantee that whoever lost that match, when they got up 10 to nothing, there was a period where they were shooting not to lose rather than to win. Because to get ahead 10 to nothing, you have to be playing to win. But then when reality sets in and you get that big lead, a lot of times players will, will kind of change their mindset and start playing not to lose and play more defensively and more tentatively. And, and I'm telling you this just because you've probably uh, had this happen in your own playing career if you've played a lot of tournaments. And, uh, and that's something you have to be aware of. When you get up on somebody by a wide margin, there's still times where you might want to play the percentages uh, and put the pressure, depending on the skill level of your opponent. But with somebody like Earl Strickland, um, you can't do that at all. Because if he senses weakness, it's not any problem for him to win 11 games in a row or 10 games in a row. So uh, that's just a little insight that uh, that might help you if you, if you uh, get in that situation in a tournament and and uh, get a get ahead by a wide margin. So, uh, yeah, there's a there's so many stories about Earl Strickland. I'm gonna I'm gonna you know highlight some and and uh, like I said, we played golf a lot together, and we used to play with uh, like Johnny Archer's a really good golfer, and Earl and Johnny played a little bit better than me. Johnny and I gambled quite a bit, and he'd give me two half si uh, two half shots aside. And uh, I remember we played Pebble Beach and, and Spyglass the same day, one day. And uh, that's one of the few times I actually beat him. I, I beat him out of $400, and that covered the green fees. It was exactly $400 to play. Uh, we played Spyglass in the morning and uh, Pebble Beach uh, in the afternoon. And I actually shot 79 on Spyglass, but we were playing from the, from the white tees. I like playing from the back ones, but Johnny wouldn't gamble with me unless we played. He had an incredible short game, or does. I don't know how much he's playing now, and he putted really, really well. So, But when we got to Pebble Beach in the afternoon, the wind kicked up, and, uh, man, it was ugly. I don't think either one of us hardly broke 100. I mean, uh, we couldn't get to the par fours with the wind against us. It was, it was like a three-club wind. 
but anyway, it was a really good day, really good time. And we used to play a lot of golf at the pool tournaments, like in between matches, because we always knew when we were going to play. And the featured matches were generally either at seven or nine o'clock at night. So that's, that's usually when we would play and we'd go out like in the morning and, and play around to golf and then have time to, to get prepared for the match and kept us in good shape. And, you know, it's a good release to get away from uh, the pressures of the competitive pool world. I remember uh, uh, Earl and David Howard and I were out playing golf one time and we came up to this par three that was like uh, 130 yards away, I think. and. Uh, you know, Earl and I hit, and then David hit a uh, six iron, <laughs> which normally would be a little too much. But but anyway, that ball went up on the green, rolled towards the hole, and fell in. That's the only time I've seen a hole in one live. And uh, I mean, of course, David was jumping up and down. We were all excited and. <laughs> We looked over at Earl, and Earl looked at David, and he said, that was a good shot, but you used the wrong club. And David's like, but I made it. And Earl's like, yeah, but you used the wrong club. You really should have hit a 7-iron, really an 8-iron. He said, I hit an 8-iron, and, uh, you know, that would have been the, the best club to hit. David's like, but I made the shot. And Earl's like, yeah, but you, you know, you used the wrong club. You know, you really need better uh, club selection. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny because like the rest of the round, uh, Earl kept jabbing, uh, David with that. You used the wrong club thing. And it was hilarious. I don't think Earl was joking though, <laughs> but David, David was like, you know, I made it. But anyway, yeah, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of stories and, and we played tennis together. Earl plays pretty good tennis. I, I played tournament tennis when I was younger. And, uh, so, uh, he's a, he's a really good player. We went out and played in LA one time when it was really hot, but, uh, I'm going to save that story for another time. And, uh, you know, we played, you know, the biggest tournament I ever won was the ESPN world open championships. And, uh, I played Earl in the, uh, semifinals and ended up beating him hill hill and then played oliver ortman in the finals to see who played vivian viverreal who won the women's uh world open that year and beat uh, allison fisher i believe and that match there was promoted heavily by espn and had uh they said 2.8 million people watching live so uh, it was a that was a thrill and i was fortunate to uh to edge that one out so I am the defending uh, ESPN Battle of the Sexes champion. So I uh, figured I would get challenged by one of the women professionals at some point to to try to take that title away from me. And it's an open, you know, I'll accept any offers. I will play anybody and give them a chance to uh, to win that uh, to win that title back. But anyway, uh, just sitting here having some. Uh, lunch hey from Florida to las vegas yeah shooter dare is my new game you can you can see that at uh shooterdare.com and it's an incredible game we're doing a our first tournament in in delaware and we're trying to make arrangements to uh to get that uh july 15th and we're gonna have qualifiers for that tournament so i will be bringing that uh all over the the country at some point but we're starting out kind of slow uh, okay, Tim Hogan. All right. Anyway, this is my first. Uh, this is for my first YouTube video. So what I'm going to do in the in the future is I am going to have these live YouTube uh, videos, podcasts. I'm going to have some guests on at some point, which will be fun, and I will answer questions live. And uh, you know, this is the first time, so I didn't expect to, you know to have a whole lot of people. But uh, I appreciate it if you would, uh, you know, like, share, and uh, you know, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and, and press that little uh, bell so that you get notifications. Because then uh, YouTube will notify you when I'm doing these videos. I've been doing the live ones all on Facebook, but I'm going to start doing them on YouTube now. And because of the shooter there, uh, YouTube is going to be more of my focus in the future. 
And if you get a chance to play that game, all the rules and example games and the promo telling, you know, what I've been doing the last seven years to, uh, to put the game together. And I got a incredible, uh, partner, uh, Casey Des hotels from uh, Lafayette. He's got, uh, a marketing advertising group called the teamwork group. And he, he on a computer is like, I am on a pool table. And so we're a really good team. We're going to bring some high tech stuff to the production quality of shooter dare. And uh, I just want to get the game back on TV. You know, I talk about ESPN. We, we've got our sights on another major TV platform that we think we can get the Shooter Dare uh, series on. I want to do a weekly show, same time, same day, every week. And, uh, you know, get as many people involved. And, and we're looking to do legs. If you go to that Shooter Dare website, you can uh, get on our membership list. And we're, we're going to start picking some people that, that want to run tournaments and leagues in the future. It's going to take, you know, the rest of the year to put this together, but, but, you know, we're going to, uh, we've got a pretty optimistic plan that we're going to put in place and I'm going to dedicate myself to it because all of my knowledge is going to be utilized in shooter dare. Um, you know, it's it's based on the rules that we used to play when gambling was the biggest in the United States. And um, we played two shot shootout or they called it push out or roll out. But the rollout in uh, shooter dare is a dare. So you're daring your opponent every game. Every game will start with a dare. And uh, there's no ball in hand. There's other rules. You're going to bring in back the spot shot for a penalty and uh and just a, it's a more uh, cognitive game. You know, you're going to have to think more, but, but the knowledge that you will gain playing this game is substantially higher than playing regular rotation pool. Uh, I would say that if you, uh, if you play shooter dare with somebody like real seriously and you, and you really want to get better, uh, in 20 hours, you can learn more than 20 months playing regular pool. I think more actually, but I'm just being conservative. There's no way to, to prove that, but I think you'll prove it to yourself if you start to play. And there's some people that just don't want to think and don't want to really get better. And, you know, this isn't for them. This is for you. If you want to get better, if you want to gain the knowledge like I did on the road and all these videos I've given from players like Omaha John and uh, Vernon Elliott, and Dalton Leone and, uh, you know, David Matlock and, and all the uh, – all the great players started out playing this two shot shootout. Like I said, I refined the game and made it a little faster and better, you know, where the quality rises to the top, where every game starts with a dare and a battle between the players for the first shot. So both players will have a chance to win every single game. And the things that, that cause anxiety, like the breaking and the racking and the jumping and the, kicking and, and stuff like that aren't in this game. They've been replaced with things that uh, just bring out the pure pocket billiard element, you know, all the best components to, uh, to highlight the entertainment value, the excitement value and the strategic value with that battle between the players for the first shot. Cause the, uh, the safeties are there, there is safeties in this game, but they're more complex and again, once you learn the shooter dare game and can play it at a higher level, all the other games will get better too. One pocket, nine ball, eight ball, because you're going to be forced to think more strategically on that push out or that dare. And then you're going to be forced to start to shoot two and three way shots. The three way shot is the ultimate as far as knowledge, because you're shooting a difficult shot. You're playing position on the next ball and you're using another ball on the table to block that pocket in case you, in case you miss. And that's one of my areas of expertise. And, and all the champion players are proficient at this shot and it opens up a whole nother level of pocket players. So, um, you know, try that shooter dare. The rules are, are on the, uh, on the website. You can, uh, you know, I'll answer questions. I'm going to do. I'm going to have a, a segment where I'm going to answer a lot of questions live, you know, maybe where I have a pool table, access to a pool table. But uh, the game 
takes 10 minutes to learn and a lifetime to master. It's not complicated, but it is different. You know, as far as the pocket zones, that's something you've never seen before. But that's what speeds up the game and takes uh, the boring elements out where players are just playing, you know, safes that that aren't entertaining and exciting. I mean, I want even the safeties to be exciting, and they are in this game. Again, so that we can uh, really get our younger players more knowledge so they can they can defend themselves against these great international players and 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 beat them but they can't do it without superior knowledge and uh and the ones that that choose to play the shooter there are going to uh you know be exposed to another dimension of knowledge that that uh, that i can see at the table but it's hard to explain but now i have a way and a, and a platform to explain it and demonstrate it and then help, you know, when I go to Delaware, I'm going to, I'm going to help uh, a lot of people learn the game at a higher level. I'm probably going to do like six clinics with the qualifiers and also private lessons and, and my normal thing there. We're going to try to do, you know, a podcast live with the pool table there with some uh, challenge matches. I'm going to play some of the best players in that area to showcase the game and 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 so that you learn it because once you learn it you know you'll see that that, that uh, it's not complicated but it's you know it is the purest form of pocket billiards it kind of has the best elements of one pocket without taking an hour to play the game these games will take four or five minutes six or seven minutes would be a really long game that'd be probably because something unusual is happening banner between the players or uh Maybe they they had several dares during the game, which sometimes happens, uh, especially, you know, at the higher level. I have to push out really hard shots against players like Earl Strickland, Dennis Ercolo, Shane Van Boning. I mean, they're uh, they're great shot makers. So so you have to you have to take that into account when you're pushing out the dare and the lower level players. I wouldn't push out quite as difficult, but uh, it's going to be an amazing time to see some of the best players and shot makers in the world battling at this game you're going to see how good they really are because it's hard to tell you know the break like uh fetter said on the joe rogan podcast is like 80 percent of the game a nine ball i mean if the break is 80 percent and that only leaves 20 percent you know of the game itself shooter there is uh you know it's about 95 percent the pure game and we're going to try through uh through experience to raise it up as close to 100 percent as we can which uh you know it's optimistic but but you know you gotta uh shoot for the stars and hope you hit the moon sometimes anyway that's about it for today i uh, appreciate you watching my first live youtube podcast sitting here in uh texas Getting ready to uh, go give a lesson, and then um, I'm planning my trip to uh, to Delaware. So if you're between uh, Dallas and Delaware, I am going to be stopping a lot of places to to work with some people just for a few days at a time. Jackson, Mississippi. I'm going through uh, like the Birmingham area, Atlanta, up through North Carolina. I got to be in Greens, uh, Goldsboro. Uh, North Carolina, the 1st of June. I'm going to be there for about five days training a lot of people from that surrounding area and then heading up through Virginia and uh, ending up in Delaware uh, probably around June 10th or 12th. It just depends. I think the first qualifier is on the 15th. So anyway, if uh, check out shooterdare.com and my you know systems, fundamentals, and uh, techniques I use to to become a top player are at cjwiley.com. So check those out if you get a chance. And uh, until next time, I'll speak with you then.